Welcome to week two of our series, A Better Way to Live. We're so glad that you have joined us on this journey to Easter. If you haven't signed up for our devotionals, I want to encourage you to do so. You can do that online and you will receive content throughout the week to help you stay connected to the messages that we're teaching on Sundays. If you have a journey card, you can check mark today that you've gathered in community. And if you don't have the card, you can find that also online. If you have any questions whatsoever, please email us at onlinepastor at marinerschurch.org or text us at the number below. There's a group of people who really want to hear from you and help you get connected with all the wonderful things that are happening here at Mariner's Church and ways in which you can serve. I hope that you enjoy the service and have a great day. Good evening. Welcome to Mariner's. So glad you're here. Come on, let's stand together. Declare the greatness of the Lord. Then sings my soul, my sin.
Saturday night, Saturday night, where are you at? It's so good to be here. Welcome to Manners. If this is your first time here, I'm so glad that you've joined us. On your way in, you probably got a bulletin, and inside that bulletin, there's a connect card. If you have a desire to be known, to be seen, to be loved here at our church, I'd invite you to fill that connect card out and take it to our welcome center. There's a team of people there that would love to meet you, help you get connected here at our church. We love to tell stories at Mariners. And uh, tonight is no different. So I invite you to grab a seat and check out this story about how Jesus is doing things at our church. I grew up in a Christian home, went to a Christian university. And when I entered into the business world right before the Great Recession, I did so with healthy motivations um, and a healthy drive. I wanted to prove myself to the world that my education was worth it and to show that, that I could hang out there. So at 23, I was the youngest district manager in the company's history. Uh, by 24, I was the youngest vice president in the company's history. The drive and the success I saw turned into a new identity 
people would ask, ask me, what is enough? And I would just say more because there wasn't a number in my head that was enough. But I remember being at my best friend's bachelor party growing up. And his dad said, Justin, what are you doing? And I straight up said, I'm trying to conquer the world. I'm conquering the world. Um, didn't even think about conquering the world and losing my soul. But the thing was, is that was exactly what happened. I was miserable. I was lacking purpose and meaning. And I just wasn't happy. I remember reading articles about people in New York, Wall Street guys that would jump off the high rise um, because they couldn't see a way out. And when I read those articles, it was, I get it. I can, I can see how you can get that far along and not see a way out. At the end of 2013, December 14th, we had our son and he lived one hour. I wanted my son back and I could never, I could never earn that, strive for it or buy it. And what I really wanted the most, I could never write a check for. So I remember leaving the hospital and going home and us just being devastated, broken going home to a house that we bought for our son um, and standing in his nursery that was supposed to be his room, just crying out to God and just crying, completely broken. And I remember asking, God, I've done things your way. And the way this turns out, I'm going to start doing it mine. And he clearly said to me, you've been doing it your way. It's time to do it mine. And what it looked like for me was breaking down um, the wall between my professional life and my faith, taking the mask off that I felt like I had been wearing to the office and truly just being the man of God that I knew that I was. I used it as another tool to continue to push myself forward, but this time with the right meaning and purpose behind it. As much as there was pain, that depth of pain creates freedom. And there was hope in a new way. Jesus restores and healed me in ways that I didn't know I was broken to be the man that I am today. Jesus has a way of taking ashes, making them beautiful, amen, of bringing purpose to pain. He's a God who heals, who restores, who gives freedom. So let's stand and let's worship this way-making God, this God who is our healer, who's moving in our church, in our lives. We worship him tonight. Touching it. 
I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop We declare, even when I don't see it Even when I don't feel it You never stop Come on, do you believe it tonight? Never stop ago our team was leading worship for an event that was here on campus and I had my three-year-old son with me Levi and he was in the back of the room and he was on a buddy a buddy's shoulders and as we were leading worship you know he was singing along first couple of songs but then I told my buddy hey you gotta you gotta videotape my son because this song Waymaker that's his jam like he loves that song I said if you, I, if you would videotape it I want to hear him sing and so he sent me the video after, after the worship set. And I was watching the video and he's running around, but then this, that song comes on and he runs up to my buddy and he says, pick me up, pick me up. I can't see, I can't see, pick me up. And it was like the Lord gently reminded me in that moment that that's what it's like when you worship me. You say, God, God, would you pick me up right now? Jesus, would you pick me up right now? I can't see. I can't see. God, I need your vision. There's some things I don't understand right now, some things I don't know, things I can't see. Would you pick me up? Your vision, your perspective, on your level, on your frequency, on your dimension, God, would you pick me up? And as a loving father does, he comes and he picks us up. And he holds us and he reminds us who we are, the child of the king. Where do you need him tonight? Where do you need his perspective, his vision for your life? Where do you need him? You first, you have to come. You've got to come to him and say, God, I need you here. I need you here. Would you remind me? If God can hold the world, he can hold you. So as a child, as a son, or as a daughter runs to the Father, run to him, run to him. Let him pick you up and remind you who you are.
Such good news. I'm, I'm so grateful, Colby, for your leadership tonight. And also, uh, even the wisdom in, in the songs that you chose for us to sing. So the, la the song before the last one is we're saying, God, this is who you are. This is who you are. And in this song, we're saying, and this is who I am. And we only are who we are because he is who he is. Right? Because he's the way maker, the healer, the promise keeper. Now we are children of God, children of God. It's a liberating truth, this truth that we're singing together tonight, that we're not, we're not singing that we are living with the pressure that we are who other people say we are, or even the pressure that we are who we say we are, because we change our minds all the time. But the glorious liberation of we can rest and rejoice because we really are who he says we are. And he says great things over you. Jesus, we've gathered together today to study you, to look at your word, to sing songs to you. We've gathered because you are great and worthy of all that we bring to you. I pray you'd use your word as you always do to change us and bring us closer into who you desire us to be. In your name I pray, amen. You can grab a seat. I want to welcome you to Mariner's Church if this is your first time. My name is Eric, and I'm the senior pastor here. We're really glad that you chose to be with us this weekend. So when I was in second and third grade, last, last weekend I told you about how I didn't make it into gifted and talented when I was in second and third grade. I have another second and third grade story. It was either second or third grade when I loved marbles. I've, a bunch of uh, people on our staff, they've, they've never played marbles. Um, one said that they only thought their grandfather played them. So that makes me feel really, really old. But when I was in second and third grade, we, we played marbles. And so I would carry a bag like this that had all my marbles in them. And we played what was called keepsies. 
Did anybody, anybody else play heapsies, right? You, you drew a circle, and then, you, and then you would put your marbles in the circle, and then you would grab your, the, the, the shooter, which is the boulder, and mine was this special bumblebee boulder. I mean, it was the best. I could, mm, this was good. And so we put all the marbles in the middle, and then with the shooter, if you knocked everybody else's marbles out, or which marbles you did, you got to keep those. You played, for, you played keepsies. And there's this, this kid at the church that my parents went to growing up, and he was actually the preacher's kid, and he had amazing marbles. He had a lot of really cool marbles. And what was really good is he was really bad at playing marbles, <laughs> which means I love to play this kid. He was a perfect narc. I mean, I, would lo- I love to go after him. I just marked him as the competitor who I wanted to beat because I could take all of his marbles. So we would put a circle and I would go home with greater marbles every single time we played until one night his, his dad came by my house and we were playing marbles and his dad, preacher dad, um, says that we can't play marbles anymore, that this has been gambling, that we've been gambling. And so he made me give back all of the marbles that I won fairly and justly from his son, he had me return those. And so listen, if you're cynical towards preachers, I get it. I totally get it. I, I laid in bed at night for several nights after that and, and thought through that very moment. I can't believe he, he took the marbles that I won. This is the first time I remember wrestling with greed. Because I, my marbles weren't enough. I wanted all the marbles. I wanted them all. We're in a series on the seven deadly sins. We're actually looking at what we're calling a better way to live. And so these are, are sins that theologians and scholars for centuries have said plague us. And it's not only Those of us who are Christians or only those who are not Christians, but even people who are not followers of Christ believe that these seven vices, they're often called, can really mess up our lives. Last week we looked at pride. This week we're going to look at at greed. I know some of you are thinking, oh, what a great week to talk about greed. I just lost X percent of my portfolio. (laughs) So encouraging to show up at church. And just so you know, we planned the messages about six months in advance. I had no idea, nor did I want that to happen in the market this week. But actually, it really is a good test for you because some of you lost greatly on paper this week, and, and and you're fine. And this is shows that greed doesn't have this big grip in your life because you still understand that that, that money was a gift and, and it, will, it will rise and fall, but your worth and your identity isn't caught up in the number that is on the screen when you pull up your portfolio. Gre- greed isn't gripping and destroying you um, viciously. And others, though, greed does. Greed just viciously destroys us. And we, we look at a number in the portfolio this week, and it feels for some like a loss in not my net worth, but a loss in my worth as a person, or my loss in my identity. And that's when you realize, this is a good self-evaluation a week like this, that's when you realize that maybe greed has a firmer grip on you than you first thought. So if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, you're, you're tracking along with us and, and just wanting to see what Christians say about these things, just understand that you didn't walk into a room today where those of us who've been Christians for a long time think we have this all figured out, as if we don't still struggle with these things. All of us struggle with all of these things. I love what a French philosopher, Jean-Luc Marion, he said this about when you become a Christian and how you still struggle. He said, Conversion does not solve temptation. In other words, when you become a Christian, it, it, your temptation for greed isn't solved. Conversion doesn't solve temptation. Rather, it heightens temptation because conversion creates resistance. Think about what he's saying. Before I became a Christian, I would just give myself fully to any vice. I didn't have a desire to fight the, the vice. But after becoming a Christian, all of a sudden, resistance is introduced. And so what exactly is greed? Well, just like last week when we talked about pride, and somebody can be filled with pride with a high view of themselves or a low view of themselves because they're still focused on themselves, somebody can be filled with greed with either a lot of possessions or very little possessions. 
Greed isn't really about what you have and possess. It's about how you view what you have and what you possess. It's your view of possessions. The scripture says it this way in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. It's the love of money that is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not money itself. It's not possessions in and of themselves that is the root of all kinds of evil. It's this longing for more. It's this longing as I had for more marbles. I don't have enough. I need more. I want the best ones. It's this lust, this longing for more and more. Greed is a longing not for the Savior, but greed is a longing for stuff. It's a longing for more and more. James Patterson, he's the famous novelist. Many of you have read his fiction novels, but he actually wrote a nonfiction book called The Day America Told the Truth. And in this book, he polled Americans and he asked them, what would you do to get $10 million? What would you do? And he said, this is the day America told the truth. And I want you to see the stats. 25% of the people he interviewed said they would abandon their entire family (laughs) for $10 million. 25% would abandon their church or their faith 23% would become prostitutes for a week. This is the day America told the truth. There is clearly in our society a longing for more and more. But I want us to do a self-evaluation of our own hearts this weekend. And so we're going to look at a story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12. And just as any time we look at a story that Jesus tells. We want to understand who he's speaking it to and then exactly who the characters are in the story. So I'm going to read the first part and you're going to see who Jesus is um, speaking to, who's he responding to, and then we're going to read the parable. And so notice verse 13 of Luke chapter 12. Someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Friend, Jesus said to him, who appointed me as judge or arbitrator over you? He then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. He says, listen, watch out, watch out for greed, because your life is much more than what you have. Watch out for greed. Just watch out for this. Because this can actually destroy you. Watch out for greed. Be on guard against greed. But who's he speaking to? Well, this guy comes to Jesus one day, and evidently he's not happy with his share of the inheritance. And so maybe his dad didn't, um, in his mind, fairly divide the inheritance, and his brother had more of the will than he had. Or maybe his brother was highly successful, and he thought he doesn't even need to get any from the will. He's already got a business where he's making a lot of cash, and so all of it should come to me. We don't know the exact scenario, but he comes to Jesus, and he's not content with what he has, and he wants Jesus to solve the problem. He wants Jesus to give him more. This is very common. This guy goes to Jesus, not for Jesus, but he goes to Jesus because he wants Jesus to give him things. Very common. He's not seeking Jesus because Jesus is the prized possession, and he just wants Jesus because Jesus is awesome. He goes to Jesus because he wants Jesus to give him thanks. This is what the scripture calls idolatry. When we take Jesus off the throne of our lives and we put something else there, and for him, it's the share of the inheritance. He wants Jesus to fix the problem, not of his heart. He wants Jesus to fix the problem of the will because he doesn't want Jesus. He wants a greater share. And so Jesus gives him this parable, and here's the story. So understand, that's why he's saying it. He's saying it because he's speaking to someone who wants more marbles. He wants more. So he told them this parable, verse 16. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life is demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? 
That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So I want to answer two questions. Why do we want to be on guard against greed? Why? So Jesus says, watch out for greed. He's speaking to a crowd. Watch out for greed. Your life is about much more than your possessions. Watch out for greed. Why? Why should we watch out for greed? What does greed do to our hearts? First question. Second question, how do we fight greed? How do we root greed out of our lives? So first, here's what greed does to us. Here's why we should be on guard against greed. Number one, greed is unquenchable. It's unquenchable. This man in the story that Jesus tells has a very productive land, which means this is the dream. He's got perpetual passive income, right? The land is producing revenue continually. It's perpetual and it's passive. It's set up to continue to go. He's got barns filled with surplus. But as you know, when you get something, it's not enough. He wants more. He wants more. He wants to tear down these barns and get bigger barns. And the Bible always speaks well of being wise and saving. So it's not as Jesus is against saving. He's speaking against hoarding against grabbing more and more because you never are quenched. And we know if you were speaking to this guy, you would say, listen, if you build bigger barns, you're still going to want bigger barns. I mean, you know this doesn't satisfy, and you have seen this in your life. Your portfolio is never going to say to you, enough. It's enough. You don't need any more. If there's clothes in your closet, then someone might say, yeah, but they're not the right clothes. If there's cars on the driveway, yeah, but they're not the right cars. Greed is unquenchable. There's always this desire for more. It's never, ever satisfied. There's never, there's never enough. I learned this not only with um, marbles, but after marbles, I moved on to baseball carts. So this is the next year for me. This is me just being completely honest, realizing that this is in all of our hearts, this desire for more, this not being satisfied. There was a baseball card shop right down the street from where I lived in the New Orleans area, and I would ride my bike there, and I would pay a couple bucks for these um, baseball cards that you would open. There'd be like 12 in the pack, right? And so I opened them up, and um, one day I got the Jose Canseco rookie card, which... That was a big deal at the time. My friends were like, no, dude, you're the... And the guy who owns the shop, he's offering me 20 bucks for it. I'm like, no, I'm holding on to this. I bought a special case. I had it in my room, the Jose Canseco rookie card. I thought this would satisfy me. Two days later, I wanted the Mark McGuire rookie card. And when I got the Mark McGuire rookie card, that, that satisfied me for three or four days. And then I wanted the Kirby Puckett rookie card, and then the Wade Boggs rookie card. It didn't take me long to realize that this longing in me is never going to be quenched. It's never going to be satisfied. This is the man in the story. It's, it's never enough. It's never enough. So why do we want to fight greed? Because if we give in to greed, it's never going to be enough. Number one, greed is unquenchable. Number two, greed is short-sighted. There's a, a story, a fable told of a very wealthy man who passed away. And everyone in town knew of the wealthy man and his accountant. And several weeks after the wealthy business owner passed away, the accountant was in the local coffee shop and some other business guys were sitting around a table and they saw the accountant and they, they, they asked him, one of them had the nerve to call him over and say, how much did he leave behind? We've been debating how much did he have, how much did he leave behind? And the accountant said, all of it. He left all of it. He left all of it. You get it? He left all of it. We do leave it all. We leave it all. That's what Jesus is telling in the parable that the rich man who wants to big build or bigger barns, Jesus says, when you die, what will be of all of that? You are going to leave it all Behind. Now, notice the motivation of the individual in the story that Jesus tells. Why does he want to build bigger barns? Because he says he wants to take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy himself. Which makes complete sense if this life is all there is. It's actually a very wise move. If this life is all there is, then eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. 
In fact, the Apostle Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. He used the same words, perhaps pulling from Jesus' parable. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15. If the dead are not raised, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Meaning if there isn't life beyond this life, if the dead are not raised, if this life is all there is and there's not eternity, then be greedy now. Eat, drink, consume, take it all in. But if there is life beyond this life, if the dead are really raised, if we have everlasting life with Christ because of what he's done for us, then we should live very differently because life isn't all about what takes place here. And so greed is very short-sighted. It's short-sighted. First time I went on a um, global mission trip or a faith adventure, I was a college student. I went to the Yucatan Peninsula, had a blast. It was an amazing week. I get home to college. I was a college student at the time, and I'm putting up my clothes, and I realize in the pocket of one of my jeans was a whole bunch of pesos, both paper and coins that I forgot to trade in, exchange, or buy something with. And so here I am in North Louisiana as a college student with a bunch of pesos that are worth nothing in that kingdom. They're worth a lot in the other kingdom where I was, but they're not worth anything in the kingdom where I spend all of my time where I live. There's no place that will take those pesos. I couldn't get a haircut with the pesos. I couldn't take um, K out to eat with the pesos. They are no good where I live. They were only good in the other kingdom kingdom. You, you get where I'm going. We live on this earth, and it is really, for those of us who are believers who have trusted Christ, this is a short-term mission trip compared to the everlasting life that we live. And it is so short-sighted. How short-sighted would it have been for me as a college student to spend the week that I spent in the Yucatan trying to make as many pesos as I could and stuff them in my pockets as if that mattered. But when I got to the real kingdom where I really lived, I couldn't use those at all. Understand for those of us who are Christians, the scripture says this kingdom here, the kingdom of this world is not your ultimate home. Your citizenship is in heaven. You have been transformed transferred into a new kingdom, the kingdom not of darkness, but the kingdom of light. And so it's short-sighted to want to consume everything in this world because we're ultimately created for the next world. We're ultimately created there. So greed is short-sighted. Lastly, why do we want to fight greed? Why do we want to get it out of our hearts? It's really foolish. Jesus uses that exact phrase in the story that he tells. God looks at the man who's wanting to build bigger barns, verse 20, and says, you fool, it is foolish. Leo Tolstoy is, or was, the famous Russian novelist who many people believe is one of the, the greatest authors of all time. He wrote uh, long form novels, but he also wrote many short stories. And one of his most popular short stories is titled with a question, how much land does a man need? It's one of his most famous short stories. And in his story, he tells the story of Pahom, who is an individual who always wants more. This is Tolstoy's story, the Russian novelist and philosopher. He, the Pahom in his story just wants more and more. He wants more land all the time. He moves his family from place to place to constantly acquire more land. And then he's given this incredible opportunity. This family wants to sell all of their land, and they have this, this crazy idea where for a thousand rubies, whoever gives them a thousand rubies can march around the land from sun up to sundown and with a spade, and whatever that individual marks for a thousand rubies, they get all of the land which is an amazing deal in Pahom's culture. So Pahom offers them a thousand rubies, he grabs a spade, and he's got the entire day. He's ready when sun goes up, and he's marking the, as much land as he possibly can get. Remember, the question of the story is, how much land does a man need? And so he's marching, and he's running, and he's getting fatigued. The sun starts to go down, and he's wondering if he's even going to make it back to the starting point, and he's running as fast as he can. He's huffing and puffing. He makes it back just in time, just as the sun is going down. And he's congratulated. He now has all of this land. Tolstoy, in his story, then tells that Bahom drops dead because of exhaustion. And he's buried in a seven-foot grave, 
thus answering the question, how much land does a man need? Some of you have a dark sense of humor. That was not supposed to be funny. <laughs> that was Leo Tolstoy for you, a lot of, dark, a lot of darkness in his writing. But it's really true, um, how much land does a man need? He spent his whole life longing for more, and it actually brought down his destruction. So greed, what does it do to us? It's unquenchable. You won't be satisfied. If you're a Christian, if you believe that you have eternal life, it's really short-sighted. Hey, listen, if you're here and you're not yet a Christian and you're like, man, I, honestly, I, I don't even believe all this stuff. I just want to live for right now. Then go, go greedy all you want. You're actually being consistent with what you believe. You're being consistent. Who's being inconsistent in the room is someone who believes all the stuff that we sing, someone who believes that Jesus is the ultimate possession, someone who believes that everlasting life is ours and it actually lives like this world is everything. I respect you if you believe, if you don't believe this and you live and act like this world is everything, I respect you because you're being consistent. What I don't respect is even the inconsistencies in my own life. When I say that Jesus is everything, but I live sometimes as if this, as if this world is, as if I just want more marvels. So how do we fight greed? There's just two ways. Two ways at least. There's more than two, but there's two ways in this story that we see. Number one, we, we fight greed. And by the way, we don't want to tame greed. We want to fight greed. We don't want to treat greed like it's a little pet in our life, like no big deal. We want to fight it and attack it. So how do we attack greed? Number one, we fight greed with contentment. With contentment. One of the most misquoted verses in the Bible is Philippians chapter 4. It is the verse where Paul's going to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a whole lot of t-shirts that have been made, Christian t-shirts with that verse. You can do everything. You know, a lot of people have said, man, you can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But that's really quoting the verse out of context. Listen, there's some things you can't do, no matter how many times you quote that verse. As many times as I've imagined dunking on DK's head, and oh, I, can't, I can't quote Philippians 4.13 like it's magic pixie dust, and all of a sudden I'm going to be this guy who can dunk, you know, Vince Carter style. I, I just, that verse isn't about that, right? The verse isn't about being able to do everything in this life. There's some things that God hasn't gifted you and equipped you to do. And this isn't what the verse is about. Notice what the verse is about. Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 11 through 13, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. So again, greed isn't about if you have a little or if you have a lot. It's about if, that, if you're satisfied with what the Lord's given. He continues, in any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Here's what he's saying. I can do this. Be content. I, 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 can, do, I can do life, whether my portfolio has fallen or my portfolio has risen. I can do this. I can be content whether the job I have now makes more than the last job or not. I, I can do this. I can be content. Why? Here's the secret. I've learned the secret, he says. Contentment isn't coming with what I have, whether I have a lot or have a little. Contentment comes from the reality that I have already received the greatest treasure and the greatest possession there is. I have received God's grace and his forgiveness and Christ has moved in. I have the greatest possession there is. And you, if you're a Christian, listen, this is the encouraging this is why you can be content. You have the greatest possession there is. You have received, you possess Christ and all of his mercy and all of his goodness and all of his grace. How do you fight greed? How do you fight greed with contentment? You remind yourself, as the Apostle Paul reminded himself, look what I have. Look what I've received by God's grace. 
Look at all that he's given me. That's how you fight greed. You fight greed with contentment. And secondly and lastly, you fight greed with generosity. You fight it with generosity. Jesus ends his story by inviting you into the story. This is how he ends his story, verse 21. That is how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. According to Jesus, everyone here, everyone in this room, and everyone watching online, every one of us, we are either storing up treasures in this world or we're ultimately storing up treasures in the next world. All of us are living either for the kingdom of this world or for the next kingdom. And Jesus says, this is how you fight greed. You be rich toward God. You be generous toward God. You invest in his kingdom. You invest in his work. He says it another way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. I want you to see how he describes it this time. He says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moss nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Notice this. Notice this language here. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. This is counterintuitive what he says. I think some of us missed this in the verse. Notice how he closes. Where your treasure is, there is where your heart goes. Sometimes we think it's the opposite. Where my heart is, that's where I'll put my treasure. But Jesus says, no, no, when it comes to the kingdom, it's opposite. You invest in the kingdom. You give generously to the work of God. And wherever you give, when you are generous and you fight greed by being generous, as you give, where your treasure goes, your heart follows. I've learned this in my own personal, in my own personal finances, in my own personal investing. I started buying Nike tennis shoes when I was a teenager because I loved Michael Jordan, loved to play basketball, and I, I would consume Nike tennis shoes. But when I first, for the first time, bought stocks and invested, put treasure somewhere, all of a sudden my heart traces my treasure, chases my treasure. All of a sudden, I care not only about what I'm consuming, but I care about the whole company. I care who the CEO is. I care about their quarterly business call. I care about how they're performing. I care so much about the company because my heart automatically follows my treasure. Your heart will follow your treasure. I still would, when I would invest in a company, I would still, of course, consume from that company. In fact, I'd consume even more because I cared even more but I care differently because my heart follows my treasure. Listen, one of the reasons some of you don't care much about God's kingdom is because you haven't given to God's kingdom and your heart hasn't followed. When you give generously to the kingdom of God, that is when your heart goes there because your heart always follows your treasure. Your heart follows your treasure. A lot of people will say, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be generous when, when like someone says something that really touches my heart, when there's this big compelling vision that grabs my heart. Just understand Jesus says it the opposite way. He doesn't say your treasure is going to follow your heart. He says your heart's going to follow your treasure. So the way to fight greed is to get aggressive with generosity because generosity combats greed. And why do I want to combat greed? Because greed will never satisfy. Because greed is short-sighted. And because greed is foolish. So let's fight greed. How do I fight greed? I fight greed with contentment. I realize that the greatest gift, Jesus, is already mine. I already have the best. How do I fight greed? I fight with generosity. Generosity is going to look different, different stages of life, different levels of income. Generosity is going to be different for everyone in the room, but we should fight greed with generosity. Ultimately, Jesus fought greed. He fought all sin. He came here and he attacked my greed and he attacked your greed by being generous towards us. How did he attack our greed? He put himself on the cross in our place for our sin. 
And on the cross, Jesus rid us of all of our sin because all of our sin was placed on him and he gave us all of his forgiveness. Jesus was generous towards us. The scripture says he was rich, but for our sake he became poor so that through his poverty we could be everlasting rich. Jesus is generous to you. He's generous to you. He's given you his grace. He's given you himself, the greatest gift there is. Jesus is ultimately generous to you. He asked us to be generous because he's been so generous to us. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart goes. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Is your heart ultimately in the things of this world or is it on his kingdom? If you want to solve that, realize where you put your treasure, that's where your heart goes. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for being so good and generous to us. I pray that you would confront us with the foolishness of our greed. It's so common. It's so frequent even in our hearts, and becoming a Christian doesn't eliminate that. We all still struggle. And so help us to be content. Remind us that we have the greatest treasure there is, you, and all of your grace and all of your forgiveness. Help us tonight to rest in the news that we possess you. Help our hearts to be overwhelmed with how generous and good you've been to us. It's in your name I pray, amen. Let's stand and let's sing and let's reflect on what he's given us, how generous he's been to us.
if there's anything going on in your life tonight that you would like people to pray with you about, we have a team of people right over there to my left at those lights that would love to pray with you. If your need is prayer for healing, we have an elder prayer room. And our elders pray every week for, after every service for physical healing, emotional healing. To get to the elder prayer room, you go through the doors in the back and you take a right. In your bulletin, you'll notice, and I just want you to pray about this as you leave. Um, people ask all the time, hey, we don't do offering, uh, we don't pass offering uh, plates like at a lot of churches. We just have boxes in the back and occasionally we'll teach and I'll say something like I just shared and we trust that God's people are gonna be generous because God's been generous to us. And I just wanna say, church, you, you have been so generous and I'm so grateful. Uh, people have wondered, you know, as our church has grown um, over the last several months, a good click. Uh, this is crazy, but usually um, every place I've been before, um, when the church grew, that generosity typically was was always trailed a, a bit behind. The, but that's not been the case here. It's, so it's like those of you who are new, you're like jumping in and giving, and I'm so grateful, so grateful for your generosity because it allows the church to do all that the church does um, in the community. But there's, if you haven't yet jumped on board with giving, we have some instructions in your bulletin on how on how you can do that. Next weekend. A couple things you need to know is it's Time Change Weekend, which means you're the only service that is not impacted by Time Change Weekend. So that's great news, which is excellent. Um, after uh, the Saturday night service next week, we also have Marriage Matters. So that will be a fun time next Saturday night. And we're going to be looking next week at um, a better way to view our bodies. And so we're going to look at uh, the sin of gluttony, which is listed as the, you know, like, I've never heard a sermon on that. I have never preached a sermon on that. So what we're going to find is that there's a lot of shame um, in how we view our own bodies. And we're going to find that God has a much better view of our bodies than we often have our bodies. So it's not going to be a sermon about, um, you know, working out more or uh, do, doing more workout selfies. It's not a sermon like that. It's a sermon about how we view our bodies the way God, the God views our bodies. There's a lot of shame around this. Um, parents of teenagers, this is a huge issue um, in, in t among, among teenagers. So I'm hoping next weekend will be super encouraging. Will you open your hands and let me pray for you as you go. Father, I pray for your sons and daughters. I pray this new week that you would remind them of how generous you've been, that they have the ultimate possession whether they are in a season of many or a season of little, whether they have plenty or whether they are struggling in this moment, I pray you would remind them that they hold the ultimate treasure, you, and encourage them with that truth this week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. Have a great week.